Hello and welcome back to the RPG Book Report. I am your host, Logician Tim. That's right. Tonight, we travel just a little bit further down the road on our epic journey, learning more about the Pendragon RPG. Specifically, we're going to be learning more about the winter phase in the game that we've been kind of talking about for a long time now. Well, here it is, finally. They tell us that winter is typically a time of rest and growth for your characters in the game. And this is where you're, you're going to be spending a lot of your time kind of maintaining, um, updating, and upgrading your character as well. And there are nine steps to this winter phase, and we're going to be going over all of them tonight. But before we jump in, I just want to ask that if you like this type of content, please go ahead and like the stream. Uh, you can subscribe too. It's, it's totally free. If you would like to support the channel, though, I do have a Patreon listed down in the description, or you could just buy me a cup of coffee instead. It's kind of like a one-time thing. There's no sign-up. It's real quick and easy. Um, there's no like recurring charges or anything like that. That link is in the description as well. Every little bit does help, and I appreciate all of you that have bought me cups of coffee up until this time. I do appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, now let's get back to the game mechanics chapter in Pendragon and learn more about this winter phase. Okay, well, we have the book cracked open here, still in the fifth chapter called Game Mechanics, where we're going to be learning more about this winter phase. Now, like I said earlier, winters are a time for rest and recuperation, and also character growth within the Pendragon RPG. They tell us that military activity generally stops during the winter, and these are the times when, you know, lords will call on their vassal knights to come and, like, feast with them at their castles and just kind of, you know, get some camaraderie going between the lords and their vassal knights. Now, the book tells us that during the winter, knights will use this time generally to, to train their skills and to hone those skills, like find a spouse, you know, do some romancing, and also catch up on kind of the goings on in the realm. Now, as far as your character goes, this is kind of when you will be doing some upkeep and some maintenance, as well as possibly getting some upgrades on your stats. So, you know, kind of pay attention to these. These, are, these will upgrade your stats, probably. Now, like I said before, there are nine steps involved in the winter phase in Pendragon, and you should go through them in order. Don't skip around, okay? The first one is perform, so, uh, perform solo scenario, if you need to. Uh, roll for your experience. Check for aging. Check economic circumstances. Uh, make stable roles, make your family roles, undergo training and, and practice, and then compute your glory, and then finally add bonuses from your glory as well. And we're going to be going over each of these step by step. Let's start with that solo scenario. Okay, now the first step in the winter phase is performing a solo scenario if somebody needs it. Uh, now in the appendix of the book, appendix three actually, uh, they provide a handful of these solo scenarios. They're kind of like these mini adventures that are designed just to be played between the game master and then one player. And these are really helpful if one of the players have kind of missed a session or two and can help them kind of get caught up on earning some glory and getting some skill checks and those sorts of things. Now, the book tells us that in later campaigns um, or later parts of the campaign that romance can actually be done in secret. So these solo scenarios are a good place to do that as well. Now, I think this idea of solo scenarios is pretty darn cool. I mean, we kind of all know that life happens and, you know, we miss a game and then we're behind and we can't get caught back up. And this these type of solo scenarios, I'll get it out. These solo scenarios are really cool to get your character back and get them caught up um, with, you know, with the rest of the group, which I just think is really cool. So, yeah, the first step is doing these solo scenarios. The second step of the winter phase is rolling for experience. Let's check that out now. So your characters generally spend some of the time in winter kind of thinking back and kind of reflecting on um, the year that has just gone by. And in the game, they simulate this kind of process by rolling for your experience, uh, getting upgrades. And we've talked about this before on previous videos where you're uh, you're doing something and you get an experience check next to like a, a passion, a skill, or a trait. And this is the part where you will actually get an opportunity to turn those experience checks uh, into possible upgrades for your character. So for each passion, skill, or trait that has an experience check next to it, you will get to roll you'll get to roll to see if you get to add a, add a point to it as an upgrade. Now, how you do this is pretty simple. 
Uh, you're just going to roll a d20 for each one individually. Okay, so don't roll one for the whole group of them. You roll in each one individually, one d20, and you're attempting to roll above the stat value of that skill or trait, right? And typically, the way they've done it, you know, for, for checking a skill, you roll, try to get underneath it. Well, when you're upgrading, you're trying to roll above it. So it makes it a lot harder the higher up that skill or trait or whatever it gets, right? So let's just say that your awareness skill is currently a 14. So what we're going to want to do is roll a D, uh, D20 and then roll a 15 or higher, and we'll be able to increase that skill by one point. So it'll go from 14 to 15, right? Uh, so let's just say we roll a 17. Uh, this means we get to increase that awareness skill one point, right? Easy as that. Now, if you roll under the stat, then just kind of nothing happens. Better luck next year, right? Now, if the value of your stat is already at 20 or even higher, a roll of 20 on the D20 will allow you to increase that stat by one. So let's just say your sword, your sword skill, you've been working on it really hard, and it's a 22. Well, you can't roll a 22 on a D20, right? Uh, but if you roll a 20, then your sword skill will now be increased from 22 to 23. Okay, so that's kind of how you can upgrade some of your stats during the winter phase, which I think is pretty cool. And there's some other ways too, so stay tuned for that. So the next step in the winter phase is aging. So let's go over that right now. The third step in the winter phase is where you're going to age your character by one year. Now in Pendragon, it doesn't matter when your character's actual birthday is, everybody will turn one year older during this winter phase. Um, and really that's all you're going to do in this aging step for a while until you reach your character reaches the age of 35. And that's where everything's going to change. Kind of like real life. It's around that 35 area. Things start to fall apart sometimes. Anyways, uh, any character that is 35 or older will roll on these aging tables to kind of see what, if any attributes will actually start losing points. Uh, so getting older and wiser is great, but uh, your body does begin to break down after a while. And this aging step kind of reflects that, which is pretty cool. So the first thing you're going to do is roll on the aging table to determine how many of your attributes are going to be affected by aging. Uh, you, roll a, you actually roll two D20 die to determine this. And you can see that it's possible that none of your attributes will change. And there's a, a maximum of four attributes that will lose a point due to getting older, right? I mean, because so, things start to fall apart. Uh, so let's say we roll an 11 on our 2d20 roll. This means we check our chart here. This means that we will roll three times on the next on the next table, the next chart, to determine which attributes are going to lose a point due to growing older. So the attributes loss table, it actually it randomizes the attributes that are going to lose a point. So it's not always just in order, uh, like constitution or strength or something like that. It's randomized for us. So since we rolled a three on the last table, this means we're going to roll three times on this table and we're going to remove a point from the attribute each time. It is important to note here that anytime uh, there's an attribute, even appearance, the attribute that reaches a value of three or less, the character is then bedridden and can no longer participate in any active play uh, and they will no longer gain glory or, you know, pretty much for anything they do. Uh, and they're pretty much done at that point. Also, once an attribute reaches zero, any attribute reaches zero, the character dies. So that's it. So um, this same attributes loss table, uh, I wanted to note real quick, is also going to be used when you get a major or a mortal wound. Uh, they suffer shock, like your character suffers a, suffers a shock from a failed passion roll or even some different types of magic. So we'll be referring back to this uh, this table from for other parts in the game as well. But I really do like this kind of idea of aging. Your character is gaining, you know, skills and passions and traits and getting stronger and stronger, but eventually their body starts to give out. And it, it makes the idea of having a family a lot more important, right? Because you need somebody to pass down, you know, those belongings that you've been kind of collecting and some of your glory because they're going to get one tenth of that. You also get to pass down some of your passions and traits because your your character will get older and they will die eventually, even if you are never beaten in battle. So I just think that's a really cool step uh, that they added here, this aging step. Now, the next step in the winter phase is the economic circumstances. So let's go over that now. Basically, this step of the winter phase is going to determine if anything major happened during, with regards to your lands or your economic needs, okay? They tell us that it's not unheard of to have your lands raided 
or maybe even cursed by fairies, which might reduce the, the production of your manor. Or, or on the other side of things, maybe you had a really good harvest and you can expect a bigger return. And the GM will kind of tell you what has happened, if anything, along with the outcome and help assign uh, to you what is called a maintenance grade. And this maintenance grade will also affect the roles for the rest of the winter phase. So take note here. Uh, so the maintenance grade, uh, grades that they have are like impoverished, which is going to mean going to give you a minus 15 modifier on stable roles and all your family roles. It's also going to decrease your armor by one point of loss reduction value due to the kind of your neglect and improper repair. Uh, you're going to have to also make a constitution roll. If you succeed that constitution roll, nothing happens. But if you fail, you're going to lose one point of constitution, just like you would through aging. So being impoverished is kind of bad, right? Uh, the next step up is poor, which is going to give you a negative three modifier to stable rolls and negative three on child survival, survival table uh, in the family rolls section. Uh, so Poor is, is, is a little bit better, but it's still you're getting negative modifiers. Ordinary uh, means there's no special effects or modifiers. The next level is rich, which is you get a plus one modifier when rolling on the child survival table. Makes sense. Uh, and then the highest one is superlative, which gives you a plus two modifier on the horse's fate table, a plus three modifier on the childbirth table, and a plus one on the child survival table. So uh, there you go. That's kind of the different economic grades that you can wind up uh, up with. Um, and the economic circumstances part is also the step where you will uh, go through everything that you picked up you know, during your adventures and you're going to sell what you want to um, and then also buy goods for the next adventuring season as well. Uh, so that's kind of how the economic circumstances work, kind of work on that grading system. Now, the fifth step in the winter phase is the stable roles. And uh, let's check out what's involved in that. As a vassal knight, you own a herd of horses. So if one of them dies or gets ruined, you know, for whatever reason, then you do have some replacements. Now, the role here on this chart is only really needed if you have a special horse like a, a large charger or an imported horse or a horse with special colors or something like that. Um, and so if you do have this special horse, you're going to roll a 1d20 for each of these special horses. And also don't forget any modifier from that economic grade from the last step. Uh, basically, the chart's going to tell you if you your special horse died or is ruined or if they're still healthy. Um, now, after your horse is seven years old, uh, it will naturally get a negative one modifier for each year of the horse's age beyond seven. So it's kind of like aging for horses. So that's kind of how this, this stable rolls work. It's really quick, not a lot to it. The next part is the family roles. Let's check that out. So the sixth step in the winter phase is the family roles. And if your character is unmarried and wants to stay that way for right now, then you can skip the marriage and childbirth parts and just roll on the rest of it. Uh, the first section of this is marriage. And this is the part where basically you can get married, right? Uh, basically, you're going to choose a wife either below your class or uh, within your class and kind of talk it out with the GM. Each one has some specific details to go through. Just work it out with the, detail, de the details with the GM. It's easier for me to say. Uh, you can also do a random role uh, for a wife. And they give us a table for that as well, which tells you kind of how much glory and money, if any, comes along with that wife. Now, you can court this way uh, as well to improve your odds on this table. And basically what you do is every winter phase, you make a courtesy roll every year. Now, if you're successful, you're going to gain a plus one modifier to this random marriage uh, table that you're going to kind of put in the bank. All right. And this will accumulate every year that you do this. So if you do this three years in a row and you, you get a successful courtesy roll, uh, each year, then you're going to get have a plus three for when you finally do roll on this random marriage table. Uh, you only get one chance at this table, though, and so you kind of want to bank some up, probably, and then do your final roll. That was kind of a cool thing to do for you that allows you to bank up some of that courtesy, almost like you're courting somebody over a long period of time. Pretty cool. Now, the children, uh, normally you're going to roll on the childbirth table, uh, whether you're married or not, actually. And that should kind of tell you something about what is going on. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. Uh, up to one annual 
A childbirth role can be rolled for every wife, lover, or, or concubine if the GM allows it. Now, after you roll to see if you have any children that were born of this year, you will then roll on this child survival table. Uh, and they're going to do this for each child that is 15 or under to see what their condition is as well. It is a cruel world, especially for kids during these times. So yeah, roll on that child survival table. And again, don't forget the modifiers from uh, your economic circumstances as well. And this is pretty cool. They have these family events tables, and these are going to tell you, um, you know, what, if anything, has happened to your family. You know, did somebody die? Was there a marriage? You know, was there some, some scandalous event? Um, and they even have a table for the scandalous event, which I love. Um, so you're going to roll on the scandalous rumors table if you happen to have a scandalous event. Uh, and they have things like, you know, a family member insulting a lord or, you know, somebody is a kidnapper or uh, something like that. Lots of fun stuff in there. Now, uh, once you do that, once you roll it and see what happened, you'll get your roll in the next table, which will tell you which family member, uh, who was it that committed this scandalous event, right? Was it your mother or was it your you know cousin or brother or something like that? So I like all these types of random events that can happen in the game, uh, especially like, you know, during the winter phase, it kind of makes it more realistic because, I mean, we know even the best families are subject to scandal. And, uh, you know, I just like the way that they put this type of stuff in the game. Pretty cool stuff. Now, the seventh step in the winter phase is training in practice. And this is where you're going to do some extra training, practicing, and also when you can make changes to your attributes, your skills, your traits, and your passions. So on this step, they tell us that you're going to choose one of the following three things. You get to choose one of these, okay? You can either gain 1d6 plus 1 points in a skill. It can be a, it can only go up to a maximum of 15. Uh, so your skill can't go past uh, 15 in this way. And they have to be knightly skills. So you can gain basically 1d6 plus 1 points in a skill. Or you can gain 1 point in a skill. That will max out to 20. Um, or the final thing you can do is improve an attribute, trait, or passion. Um, you pick one and you can either raise or lower that stat by one point. And this kind of represents you kind of training in the winter time and sharpening those skills, or maybe you took some time to unwind and kind of really think about that passion that you have where you're able to lower by one point or something like that. I just really like the fact that you can change things during this winter phase uh, to kind of customize that character and keep it fresh uh, when you're playing it. Pretty cool stuff. Now the next step is computing your glory. So let's take a look at how that works. So this is where you're going to total up all your glory that you've earned during the year and apply it to your total glory. So things like your glory from when you're playing, like you, you killed a bear or you defended uh, the city and you earned some glory or uh, glory from any of those solo scenarios that you had, uh, glory from passions and traits that are over 16. Chris, remember if you have trait like um, a certain trait that is a 16 or higher, you get to add that much glory. So let's say your trait is 18, then you add 18 glory um, for every trait like that, right? So don't forget that. You also get glory from your unique honors, things like getting married or getting promoted, uh, those type of things. Don't forget about that. Then you also get annual glory, which you get from holding certain types of castles will earn you glory, for example. So check into all that stuff too. Now, after you get all your glory added up, you will then move on to the next step, which is kind of figuring out your glory bonuses. So you remember that you get to add a bonus point to your stats for every 1,000 glory that you have. And you get to do this every winter uh, session, okay, winter phase. So if you have, you know, 3,400 glory, then you'll get to add three points to your stats pretty much wherever you want. Uh, you can apply these to any attribute, trait, passion, or skill, and you can increase them over 20 this way as well. So if you've got some that are uh, up there like 18 or so, it's really hard to get that upgrade uh, when you have experience checks against it because it's hard. You have to roll uh, 19 or 20, something like that. Well, you can use their glory to increase those stats to 20 and get them way up there. So pretty cool stuff that they have there for us. That is it for me tonight. Uh, we did learn about all nine steps of the winter phase. It seems like this would be really cool in like an in-between session where everybody kind of gets together and does some maintenance stuff on their characters while the GM is possibly getting ready for the next set of adventures. Uh, some really cool stuff. 
Now, next time I will be diving into the sixth chapter, which is combat. And we're going to learn all about the different phases of combat, knocking down opponents, uh, using armor and shields and those types of things. It sounds like some really good stuff. Thank you so much for wa watching. I just want to ask that if you do like this type of content, go ahead and hit the like button for me on the video. It does help out, believe it or not. Um, if you uh, want to sub subscribe, go ahead. It's totally free. If you'd like to support the stream, I do have a Patreon that's listed down below, or you could just buy me a cup of coffee instead. And that link is in the description as well. Um, it's kind of like a one-time thing. There's no sign up. It's real quick and easy. No re reoccurring charges, anything like that. You just buy a guy a cup of coffee and you support the channel. It's as simple as that. And I do thank you so much for the people that have bought me coffees up until this time. Every little bit does help you guys. It really does do appreciate it. I will see you all on the next one we'll, where we'll be going over the combat in the Pendragon RPG. See you then. Bye.